Welcome to the Frozen Layer Podcast, brought to you by Zentech Consultant CA, where we will discuss all things related to the CAD, BIM, and construction markets, with a little humor thrown in for good measure. I am your host, Steve Fahey. Let's get into it. Good morning. Our goal with the Frozen Layer is to share valuable information that our CAD, BIM, and construction clients will find useful and help them increase productivity, just like freezing a layer in CAD. I'm pleased to have Robert Green joining me today. Robert, welcome to the podcast. Always a pleasure, glad to be here. Uh, Robert has an extensive background in the CAD management engineering fields. I'm sure most people listening probably already know him just by the name alone. Uh, Award-winning speaker who has traveled the world talking about CAD, also a Catalyst editor and author. I could go on and on, um, you know, make you feel a little bit better, but <laughs> I'm sure everybody would, would prefer to have you give a quick overview and uh, of your background and what's got you to this point. So uh, if you wouldn't mind doing that. Yeah, you bet. So uh, I was a mechanical engineer by, by training and background and uh, got out of school, was doing ma machinery design, things like that, and uh, started doing CAD technology as a function of that. Um, early on, using some high-end solid modeling and analysis stuff and getting into the uh, desktop CAD, kind of as it, as it was born uh, early on in the process. Um, as I worked more and more in, in corporate America, I, I became disillusioned with the corporate work scene, uh, but I loved what I was doing. So uh, one day, showed up for work at the, the company that I was at, and they'd been abruptly shut down. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I, I had no job and, um, and I thought, why don't I try doing this on my own? Yeah. Um, you know, I, I, I can always go back and, and get another job if I need to. And so, um, I became unemployed 32 years ago. I've been unemployed ever since <laughs> and have, have just been, been doing this in a, a consulting role. Um, I started really focusing on, on technical things, you know, um, setting things up, getting systems, working, training people, uh, interfacing with uh, IT groups, uh, people who were who were setting things up, uh, and then I started to become more interested in the managerial aspect of it, the the communication, the finance, uh, talking to the bosses who would fund ultimately the the systems that I was working on, and I came to be a lot more fascinated by those soft skills mm -hmm. that I needed to to manage things effectively. That's when I started writing. That's when I started talking to user groups and such, and. And that's when people got to know me. But uh, I, I spent quite a few years in the trenches making this stuff work yeah. <laughs> before that before that that aspect of, of my career took off. And so, um, you know, I just started doing that and uh, the opportunities came my way and I just kept saying yes. And I kept learning. And here we are. So the 32 years of being happily self-unemployed. <laughs> self-unemployed. That's correct. Well, that, that's an impressive uh, track record for sure. And uh being in the industry as as long as you have been, I'm sorry about uh, phrasing it that way, <laughs> yeah. but you know we're, we're in the same boat, so we can get away with it. Years go by. <laughs> um, as you've been, you know, as long as you've been in the industry, what are the biggest changes you've noticed related to the CAD manager's role? I would say that in the last ten to fifteen years, anyway. What I've really noticed is just the sheer volume of software that we have to deal with. Yeah, uh, it, it it used to be that you would deal with uh, maybe an, an AutoCAD, a, a MicroStation, two three CAD engines, and then just just enough of the the networking and and such to kind of glue it all together and make it work, and that that was it, you know. And, and you were I was also spending quite a lot of time on jamming electrostatic plotters and you know dealing with things like that. Um, these days, you know, every, everything's captured to PDF files, but I'm having to support 10, 12 different pieces of software yeah. uh, on a routine basis. So, so the game has really changed from being a software expert in a narrow band um, uh, of tools to being a software integrator in a very wide band of tools. And I think that's, it, it's a profound change. Uh, they, it, it requires a different set of skills and the uh, the ancillary thing to that, and particularly post COVID, 
has been that uh, your your CAD is only as good as your IT. You know, there's security concerns. There's, uh, you know, are, are people copying things off to personal devices? There's a whole lot more file management, information management, security uh, in this job than there used to be. So th those are the, the two big changes that I've seen. And if you can't keep up with that, you, you'll drown, certainly. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I remember when Autodesk introduced mechanical desktop and I thought it was a lot of software. And you look at today's world and like you said, ev everything yeah. has its own, well, we need to use this and we need to use that. It's like, well, when do you have time to learn all of this? And the implementation just gets over overwhelming sometimes. So, Correct. Uh, yep. Further to the last question, how have you noticed the advancement of BIM managers uh, impact on the CAD manager's role? I love this question because I'm going to get in trouble now, but I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm going to go ahead and say it. I don't think it's changed really anything, honestly, because a, a really good CAD manager has always been forward thinking. They're always thinking about what is my deliverable? How am, I, how am I going to organize people to work in the most effective way? Where am I going to store my information? How am I going to secure that? How am I going to make sure that we're not writing old things over new or uh, having parallel revisioning tracks? And these are all the things that BIM managers do. Yeah. And, and, and they, they want you to believe that this is a new thing, and it, it's not. Um, so to me, a, a very proactive planning focused CAD manager has always been essentially what a good BIM manager is now. And coming from a, a mechanical and manufacturing background, I was managing this sort of stuff in, in manufacturing environments 30 years ago. Yeah. We, we created models. We cut 2D prints off of that. We sent DXF files to machine tools. We were essentially doing BIM while building cars or, or cutting parts 30 yeah. years ago. This is not new. Yeah. And and I, I don't think the skill set is new either. So I've probably just antagonized everybody on the AEC side of the house. <laughs> but uh, but I, I don't think it really represents a new challenge. I really don't. Yeah. Well, and I think what it comes down to is each firm deciding what works best for them and deciding, do we have a good CAD manager? Maybe we need a BIM coordinator. Maybe, you know, you have to have somebody in those roles, but they need to support one another and work together and, and make sure that they're, they're working in the best interest of the firm moving forward. But, you know, a lot of good points. Yes. And, 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 you know, like you, you, you frequently hear on the AEC side about, you know, well, it's too complex to have all of these details in BIM. And then, you know, everybody flips back to how complex is it to design a 747? or bullet train, like, you know, there's a lot of moving parts and a lot of pieces in there and the, the manufacturing mm -hmm. design software can do it all. Why can't we get more information out of a building? So the, there are always the, the stories that bounce back and forth on, on how things can be working better and, and how we should be moving forward. But that's a good thing about our industry. It, it never sits still. And, you know, it, I, it I, does. I, and yeah, and, and obvious, obviously to, to manage the, the BIM process from, you know, from initiation to delivery, you are going to need deep knowledge of that software. I don't mean to, to say that anyone with no idea of, of BIM tools can be a BIM manager. They can't, just, just no, no. like I can't be a, a mechanical CAD manager without knowing that software. Yeah. But the the process, the mindset, yeah. the the management of, of the workflows, I, I think it, it it's a philosophy, it's an approach, yeah. more so than it is a piece of software. Yeah. No, I would agree with that. Um, the cloud has worked its way almost into daily conversation. You, know, you don't go very far yes. without hearing about the cloud. Um, what are your thoughts on cloud versus on-premise and in relation to CAD? And, you know, do you see any pitfalls on, on either side or advantages on either side? I... I probably most CAD managers have seen the disadvantages because they've dealt with, <laughs> with the problems. Um, when, when I really noticed it was during the pandemic. And what continues to amaze me is how IT departments think that you can simply put a CAD or BIM user onto a shared volume 
yeah. via some sort of skinny low bandwidth connection and think that it will simply work. You know, CAD and BIM is not opening a spreadsheet. It is not editing a Word doc. These files are big. I mean, they're 50x, 100 times uh, the the size of, of the things that are being managed. Now, we had a particular case uh, during the pandemic where a company had uh, they had a remote office that was trying to open up a something like a four to 500 megabyte land background. And they didn't understand why it didn't happen immediately. I said, mm -hmm. well, it's a big file. There's physics involved here. Yeah. You know, there's, <laughs> there's speed of light and latency issues that, that you just can't get around. So it, it's, it's kind of amazed me. It's not the technology. It, it's the, the lack of understanding of, of how the tools work. So having said that, I think that, users always judge CAD system performance on speed. They, they want to move their mouse. They want it to happen. They want things to process. They want it to happen. They don't want to wait 20 minutes for files to resolve. And, and that I'm the same way. You probably are too, you know, when you, when yeah. you work on, and, and if, if somebody told you that it would take 20 minutes to edit your word doc, you, you would, you would absolutely revolt. Yeah. But, but yet that's considered to be normal in a CAD environment. So I, I tend to be a, a big fan of working on prem yeah. with local high power workstations. And most people who use CAD tools, I know, feel the same way. Uh, the, the cloud environment is going to have to move much more into localized replication, smart Delta replication of data. You know, as we're starting to see some, some software tools and some things that integrate neatly with the, Microsoft uh, server infrastructure, that's going to be the answer. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we're all going to do our online banking and we're all going to share our pictures on OneDrive and all that. But doing doing massive uh, collaboration and design, it's not ready for prime time yet. Yeah. I, I don't think so. Yeah. Well, uh, you know, baby steps towards everything. And like you say, the Good thing yes. about good thing about technology is that they're always making it better or attempting to make it better. Sometimes there's a baby step back to get a giant step forward, but <laughs> well, we'll just Correct. have to keep watching that and hope for the best. So um, you bet. we're, we're going to take a quick break and hear a word from our sponsor. And when we come back, uh, I'd like to dive in and have a little discussion about AI in CAD. So we'll be right back. Today's Frozen Layer podcast is being brought to you by our Zentech training division. Zentech has a variety of training options available from public courses, private group courses, on-demand courses, as well as custom courses to meet all your design needs. We offer training in Bluebeam, Autodesk, Procore, and BricsCAD with options from beginner through to advanced. To learn more, visit our website, zentechconsultants.net, or give us a call, 866-824-4459, or you can email sales at zentechconsultants.net. Zentech Consultant CA for all your technology consulting needs. Welcome back to the Frozen Layer Podcast with our special guest today, Mr. Robert Green. Robert, as I mentioned before the break, I'd like to get your perspective on AI and CAD. Do you think it's much ado about nothing? Do you think it's going to be a difference maker? Should we be worried about Arnold coming back and Skynet starting to design our buildings? <laughs> like, you know, just just wondering wh wh where we're going with this. <laughs> I, I I love the the mental image of you know I'll be back. Yeah, that's um, the first thing I thought of. <laughs> well, honestly, I mean, you know, there's there's my impression, which is of course, anytime there's something new and whiz bang, obviously it becomes marketing hype. And obviously that that's propagated uh, to get you to spend money on things. Yeah. You know, we, we can can look at Autodesk AI as an example, you know, where they're they're, they're clearly trying to tie new products to, you know, the AI trend um, <coughs> or, or buzzword. Um, and, and I think that's that's a big piece of it is it's, it's just really honestly marketing hype quite a lot. And then, of course, there's the negative side of it where you see, you know, it is Arnold, you know, or is the world going to be taken over or things like that? And I, I think probably like like almost all things, the truth is somewhere down the middle um, uh, of, of where this is going. I don't see it really changing a huge amount of, of what I'm doing, at least not yet. What I do see it revolutionizing is the way that you search the Internet. 
Mm-hmm. Um, you be because it it is doing a fabulous job of um, trying to sort through a very large variety of things and using very high power search algorithms that I wouldn't necessarily think to do. Yeah, you know, from just just sitting at a Google interface. So I I think that's going to be the main thing. You know, once once intelligent searches are you know show me show me every a uh, five millimeter bearing that I can get with a certain degree of stainless steel that will never corrode in an acid bath in 20 years. Yeah. That's a pretty, pretty targeted search. And that's the kind of thing that I, I think GPTs are, are going to allow us to do. The, uh, the speech interface portions of it that where I'm, I'm seeing, like, for example, I get emails from, from clients now. And I'm like, that does not sound like that guy. <laughs> I've been receiving emails from this guy for 10 years. Um, and and I'll, I'll ask him, yeah, sure enough. Well, I'm using Chat GPT to try and jazz up or, or you know improve my business communication. I'm not so sure that that uh, it, is really going to change anything about the way human beings work. Uh, I, I don't see it replacing anybody in a design chain other than the people who are, are really just kind of moving things from spot A to spot B. Mm. Very low value tasks, I think, could could potentially be replaced. Yeah, and it, it's it's hard for me to imagine how customer service could get any worse. So perhaps <laughs> AI will will help us with that. Yeah. But, uh, so I, I'm I'm cautiously optimistic that it will help us in some areas, but but skeptical that it will really change things much. Yeah. Well, I, I like your search engine analogy because I frequently tell people that the internet is basically a landfill, and everybody throws their garbage into the landfill. Yes. And when you go out on Google and start doing your searches, all you're doing is picking up other people's throwaways to say, is this applicable? Is there anything good here? And, you know, I've frequently been caught myself reading an article and think, oh, this is really good. And then all of a sudden you notice it's 12 years old. And, you know, sure, it was a good read, but it's not really applicable to today. But you don't Perhaps know not. until you get into it far enough that say, ah, okay, I guess I should have checked that sooner. But... That's the problem with the internet, you know, so I, I agree. I think with the, the GPTs, I think if you can do that refined of a search and, and get them to go and do that detailed for you, I think you'll, you'll get some benefit. So, so leading into, you, you kind of touched on my next question a little bit, so I'll rephrase it slightly. Um, I was going to ask if you were seeing more clients utilize AI. I, I think what I'll, what I'll go with is maybe let's talk about the difference, because maybe not everybody understands it, the difference between AI and machine learning, because a lot of people conflate them and think that machine learning is AI. And, you know, you look at a product like BricsCAD, BricsCAD has a lot of tools in there that work very well, that it's more along the lines of machine learning, and it repeats your task and learns from how you're operating. So what, what are mm-hmm. your thoughts about those things moving forward? Yeah, I was actually fortunate enough to be involved with some of that um, development activity when they were doing that. I mean, I was sitting there when uh, Wudernese and Chloe Guidi were working on it. Yeah. <laughs> it's it, so so essentially what what gets talked about in terms of machine learning really is pattern recognition when yeah. you get right down to it. Um, if, if you pull up a, a DWG formatted file and you start looking for repetitive patterns of geometry that may be translated everywhere or rotated in certain manners, um, all it, all it, and this is their, their Blockify function, and we now see that AutoCAD 2025 has something very, very similar to that. Uh, they, there, there's nothing artificial about it. There's an intelligent human being who programmed that, yeah. um, who, who is telling the machine, okay, here's the kinds of things that I need you to look for, and then they're building a very wide data table or, or array of data that's being held typically off on another processor core. And that's, that's the difference. Yeah. Um, honestly, what's there's, there's, there's no magic really. Um, machine so, uh, learning I, I is, uh, does with machine learning, we do get instant results, which is nice. It is benefiting us in the daily design world. Whereas AI, like the, you said, more of a pipe dream. If the software is, is crafted that way. And yeah, you know, historically, a lot of the CAD tools that we use have been very, very clock speed related and, and very bound to a single processing core. Yeah. So I, I think that the change that we may see as CAD users is that we're going to see more parallelizing 
um, of, of the processing, even though the, the you know, the Autodesk and, and the BrickScads and the Graph Techs and everybody who, who's out there working on this, they're not making their CAD engine multi-core per se. Yeah. But they're, but they're hangling, uh, they're hanging all these different tools off, off the side of it on other cores to make it faster. Yeah. The, um, I, I will say that the one thing, and, and I'm going a little bit sideways here, so I apologize, but the, the one thing that, that really does concern me um, about companies getting into this is, and, and you starting to look at, at more of the software tools, they are encouraging you to upload your data uh, or if we talk about the the language, you know, the GPT-3.5 and 4 that, that's using a, a language analogy to generate written text. If you upload your data into that, your data is not your data anymore. Yeah, it's public domain. And, and I've, I've, had, I've had a number of people email me and say, you know, I, I put something into chat GPT where I was like, help me write a CAD standard. And I saw an entire paragraph of one of your Catalyst articles come back. Yeah. Uh, and that that to me is, and I'm just going to say it the way I see it, that is intellectual property theft. Mm. This is, you know, it's no different than than Napster was copying music files. Uh, it's if, if you put your data in there, it, it goes off and you don't know where it's sitting and you have no idea whom else is using it. So mm. I, I, I think the biggest thing for us to talk about here is not not Skynet or not, you know, AI setting off nukes. I think it's you losing your, your proprietary work. Yeah, um, is, is what concerns me. And, and we're, we're absolutely in the Wild West. Yeah. Uh, and on on this topic. So uh, everyone needs to proceed very carefully here about sharing their intellectual property. Yeah, well, I'm glad you made that point because a lot of people are not aware of the fact that when you share it, it does go yeah. up and it's part of the domain for every search engine, every search that that engine does from that point forward. Your data is yes. now part of the part of the research that it's using. So I think it's and important the for people implied. to know. Yeah, yeah, yeah the incent is implied. Yeah. Oh, that that's a very good point. Um, I'm gonna date myself a little here and uh, have a, a little flashback moment with you. Uh, as you know, of course, I've been in the, the CAD game for, for quite a while. I was in the Autodesk channel for 29 years selling and supporting Autodesk and third-party products. But when I first started in, in college, I learned AutoCAD and very shortly after I got involved with VersaCAD and then MicroStation. And um, of the three, I, I, I do have to admit, I probably probably uh, enjoyed and missed VersaCAD the most. I think it was just an incredible 2D drafting tool. It was- It, it had a big fan base. It did, and you know, VersaCAD, VersaCAD with Nth Engine for, for your instant zooms and and mm -hmm. no regens, and and you know, you get uh, F6 to match properties in 1989. And you know, I think it was 2000 or 2001 before AutoCAD had that same functionality. So the, the power it had is early on. It was, it was good. We we did a, we had a context flatbed scanner back in 1990, and we used to scan a lot of old paper drawings that clients had no CAD file for. And I would do all of my conversion work of the vector to fat raster or vector in VersaCAD, and then DXF it over to AutoCAD, and make it match the client standards and give it to them. And it was faster for me to do it with the process of going from one to the other than it was to do it in AutoCAD at the time. So <laughs> really, really liked using using VersaCAD. So um, have all of that sort of leading me to my next question of after all of the years that you worked, as you say, you know, working with Autodesk and helping AutoCAD and clients and such, and you mentioned there on the last question about working with Brixis, um, in 2018, when you started to have interactions with them, what kind of led to that move? I had been um, tasked over the years uh, with my work with Catalyst Magazine at keeping our eyes on low-cost CAD tools. You know, the, the, the question always was, okay, AutoCAD's expensive. Yeah. But, what what can we do to to do something that costs less and keeping an eye on those other tools and of course th this started a long time ago and my my answer typically was well i i even though they cost less i'm not interested because i can't run my lisp routines and i can't i can't 
bring my customization, the things that make me productive, I can't bring over. Yeah. And if I start experiencing incompatibilities, I now spend time fixing that. Yeah. And so any any cost differential was absorbed due to incompatibility. Well, as as we started looking at this, um, I started looking at some of the earlier versions of BricsCAD, and while it was not real robust at that time, I was intrigued because they they were starting to run some of the the simpler Lisp uh, menu macros, mm-hmm. and I was like, okay, you have my interest. And then as as each subsequent release came out, that got better and better, and it, and it got to a point where I was looking at uh, Br- BricsCAD v19, where I'm good. This is really pretty good. Uh, so I, I loaded up some of my uh, stuff that I'd done for clients to benchmark it, found a few little warts, but really nothing major. So that led to me going and covering their user conference one year, uh, where I got to talk to the dev staff and the owners and uh, really became impressed with what they were doing and the the commitment they had uh, to providing a lower cost alternative. And so I, I just kind of stayed with it. The rest is is history kind of thing. <laughs> well, yeah. I remember when, when we first started, I mean, I a lot of my early sales calls, I was going into an architect's office and they were sitting behind a board drawing by hand. And you were trying to convince them to say that this computer thing is going to be better for them. And right. you're at that point, you were basically talking to an artist who felt like my entire career this drawing looks and feels like a design that I did. Anybody in the city can look at this drawing and know, oh, Arthur did that or Bill did that. You can tell by the, right. the line work and the, you know that's his flair. And I go into a computer, I'm the same as everybody else, and I can draw this floor plan by hand faster than you can do it in that box. And so, you know, I remember all those conversations, but another yeah. another conversation I had with them was, you know, the early days of AutoCAD, which a lot of people forget, AutoCAD was going up against more powerful higher end solutions at the time that were already established and our logic was autocad can do 80 percent of what you guys your current system can do but it's only 20 percent of the cost how Mm -hmm. often do you need that extra 20 percent and that was the compelling event a lot of people started saying yeah maybe you're right maybe we shook and autocad started to pick away at that and start to do it flash forward 35 40 years AutoCAD is perceived as the high expensive product and yes. you bring in a product like BricsCAD and you know BricsCAD to AutoCAD can do pretty much full swap out. If you're looking at the tool sets, it's a different story there, but you know, it's a similar thing where BricsCAD can do probably 80% or more of what you're doing with your high end tool. Why are you continuing to spend these thousands of dollars a year per user? when you have an option right. that can do it. So it's it's funny how, like you said, everything goes full circle and you know I'm having this similar conversation that was used by Autodesk to benefit them is now being used against them because they, they've, right. got, they've moved into that, that role. So, so when you started uh, working closer with BricsCAD and getting more involved with them, uh, what stood out to you most about them as a, as a product and a company? Initially, it was the licensing options, um, much much more, not just cost savings, but much more flexibility, uh, continuing to offer the, the pooled licensing, for an example, yeah. um, as Autodesk was, was clearly going off to subscription that was becoming more and more named user. Um, so there was an economic advantage and a business advantage to being able to, to get those licensing options. And then after that, as I started to, to see more of what they were doing on the development side, you know, very, very deep API integration uh, became clear to me that if they if they chose to pursue a certain path of, of integration and compatibility, they could do it. Yeah. They, you know, there, there was a, a, a high horsepower engine on the frame, if you will. Yeah. And, and, uh, and, and that they would be able to, to get to whatever that point was. And that they were in fact doing that for certain customers that were coming to them and saying, hey, you know, we'd love to do this. We'd love to save the money, but we need this little piece of compatibility in order to do it. And they would do that. Yeah. So, yeah, it, it just uh, it, it was a different culture. You know, it was like looking at a kind of a small startup spirited company versus a big corporate monolith 
Yeah. But, and, and now, of course, Brixis, I feel they still have that mindset, but of course they're part of the Hexagon group, which a lot of people don't realize, but, you know, Hexagon, 25,000 employees, 6 billion euros or thereabouts in annual business. So absolute yeah. massive, massive player. And it, it has played a lot of benefit to, uh, to Brixis because of the Leica division and a lot of the advancements they're making with point clouds and and different technology and it's working its way in mm -hmm. to making BricsCAD a better better solution for clients as well. So, all well right. Plus, I think one, one other thing I'd point out there is that uh, when you're a small startup, you know, kind of rabble rousing smaller company, you know, trying trying to go up against the big guys, you're always kind of worried about, uh, you know, legal threats, legal challenges. You know, it's a David and Goliath kind of thing. And at some point, Goliath truly can just step on you. Yeah. Um, so so by being acquired by Hexagon, you know, it gives them the the backing, the mass, you know, the, the financial protection of that large holding company. Yeah, that they're not going to uh, get acquired. Yeah. Right. Because that, that can happen as well. That, OK, these guys are getting a little too close or we're getting a few too many sales moving over this way. Why don't we acquire them and. And just any functionality they have, we'll work it into our solution and just shut that division down. Or you know, sue just, them. Or, yeah, yeah. Or whatever. Just, yeah. You see that quite frequently. So, mm -hmm. All right. Well, I'm, I'm going to pick that big brain of yours and, and ask if you have a quick tip for our listeners today, something you can share that might make, uh, make them a little more productive. What I would say, whether you're a tech manager, of course, I tend to think that way because I've been you know customizing and supporting tools for other people but no matter who you are to me what i've always done that has served me well is to look at what is the work product that i'm being told to deliver and whether whether that's you know a print or a model or a, a coordinated bim set whatever that is just focus on how you can best do that how you can most quickly do that, how you can do that at the lowest possible cost point. If you do that, you won't fall into the, the trap that I call tool envy or tool worship. Yeah. And there's this saying, right? If the only tool you have is a hammer, the entire world starts to look like a nail. Don't ask yourself the question, how can I best do this with Revit or how can I best do this with AutoCAD? Ask yourself the question, how can I best do this? Yeah. And, and, answer those answer that question that will lead you to the best way to do things yeah. no matter what tool it is that that you're using yeah. and that's when when i've done that in my career uh, I, i've done well yeah well it's uh similar to uh analogies i frequently use where i tell people you know you can show up to a foundation in the ground to build a house and have a hammer and a handsaw and you can build the house you have the tools and the knowledge to build the house. But if you look at the job and what's required and you show up with your hammer and a framing gun and a chop saw and a roofing gun and there are all the new modern tools that are available, you're going to finish the house quicker, most likely mm -hmm. be a better build, more efficient cuts, closer cuts, everything else. So very similar where slow down, look at the project, pick the tools that are going to get you to the finish line and then apply them and, and try and get it. So, you know, it's a good lesson to learn to, as you say, not to get so caught up in new functionality and how can we use it to, to get something and all of a sudden it goes off the tracks. But if there's proven technology that I know how a chop saw works and it's more efficient than a handsaw, then you can start introducing those types of things. So use it by all yeah. means. Yeah. All right, Robert. Well, I'd like to thank you for joining us today on uh, the Frozen Layer podcast. And uh, until next time, keep freezing those layers. <laughs>